we're going to learn about a chi-square. Chi-square is the test we do when we're dealing with qualitative variables. So no longer are we dealing with number outcomes. This is the symbol for a chi-square on the left here. It's the Greek symbol chi, and we've squared it. Um, I will ask you how to pronounce it. It's chi-square as in kite, not chi as in the T. But chi-square is a totally different approach to dealing with different kind of data that we haven't had to deal with so far. So let's review what we've learned so far so we know how to map it on. Remember we had started this table when we were discussing correlation and regression. I just want to recap a little bit of what we've learned so you can kind of see where we're going. We first started with a one sample z, and that was where we were looking at how one condition predicts some kind of number outcome. And then we moved on to a one sample t, where we also had one condition predicting a number outcome, but instead we no longer knew sigma. We didn't know the standard deviation. And so, uh, sorry, the standard deviation of the population. So we had to do a totally different approach. Then we moved on to a dependent t, where we looked at typically before and after scenarios predicting a number outcome. We then talked about an independent t, where we had two separate conditions predicting a number outcome. And then there was the ANOVA where we had three or more conditions predicting a number outcome. Then lastly, we just learned about correlation regression where we had numbers predicting numbers. So the one thing left that we haven't done is just dealing with conditions themselves. So no number outcomes. So we have the chi-square where we're gonna look at how a condition can either just be explored on its own or predict another condition. Do you see how that hasn't been explored so far? So I want to give some examples to these because I think it'll make it a little easier to see. So let's say for the one sample Z, we were looking at Saddleback College students and we wanted to see how they did on the GRE. A GRE is a gra graduate record examination. It's kind of like an SAT to get into grad school. So for a one sample Z, we would have looked at all Saddleback College students to see how they performed on the GRE test. For a one sample T, we would have looked at a sample of Saddleback College students to see how they performed on the GRE test. For the dependent T, we may have looked at uh, before and after attending Saddleback College, how you performed on the GRE. So you take the GRE before attending Saddleback College and then the GRE after. See how I'm trying to map on what we've learned with a, a particular example here? For the independent T, perhaps you can guess what I would do. I would have to be looking at two different conditions. So perhaps I would say Saddleback College versus Irvine Valley College and see how they differ on their performance on the GRE. If I was gonna do an ANOVA, perhaps I would do Saddleback College versus IVC versus Orange Coast College and see how they differ on their GRE performance. For correlation and regression, I can't lump Saddleback College and IVC anymore because those are nominal variables correlation regression that they be both ratio. So maybe I would look at the number of units students take and see how that predicts their GRE score. For a chi-square, perhaps what I would do then is say, well, what about Saddleback versus IVC students? And I might just be interested in, are there more Saddleback College students versus IVC students? But I could also use that to predict what their major was. So notice it can't be GRE because that's a number outcome but maybe I wanna see how Saddleback College and IBC differ in the number of majors or the, the types of majors that people uh, select. Now, if I was just interested in one variable for the chi-square, let's say I wanted to know if there were the same number of students enrolled in Saddleback as in IVC, I could do what is called a goodness of fit. And what will happen is, if we wanted to see if the same number of students are enrolled in Saddleback and IVC, I might want to see if my total count for both populations is 50% for Saddleback and 50% for IVC. So I want to see how well the real numbers fit my model of 50% and 50%. I could also do a goodness of fit for major. Maybe I want to see if all the majors are equally distributed, and so I want to see how well um, the actual count of majors fits my model. However, with a chi-square, we can go one step further and we can combine two variables. So if I wanted to see if the Saddleback and IVC students had different preferences for major, I then would be looking at a test for independence. And essentially what I'm trying to do is see if the pattern of major selection is different for Saddleback students as it is for IVC students. 
In other words, are they acting independently and they have their own patterns? Now, I have a whole nother video lecture about goodness of fit and test for independence and how we calculate those, but I wanted to put them here so that you understood that a chi-square kind of has two pieces. We can look at just one variable at a time and see how well it fits any ideas or models of being equally distributed, or we can do a test for independence and combine variables to see if they're acting independently or not. So there are some downsides of using a chi-square. The strength in statistics comes from predicting variability. So if we have very little variability, then the utility of statistics is um, limited. So remember when we were dealing with number outcomes before, we had a distribution that perhaps looked like this. And all this variability is what was giving us strength in making predictions. Remember, all of our formulas had standard deviation in their calculations. Standard deviation plays a big role in predicting things. So we have people who score up high and people who score down low and people all in between. And our ability to predict where you're going to land in this distribution is benefited from the more knowledge that we have. But if we're dealing with something um, like a nominal variable that has no real variability, then there isn't a lot of variability to explore and explain away. So for example, if I was just looking at the number of students who pass and fail the class, it's basically pass, fail. There's little variability between those two options. If I could, it would be better to look at their um, performance in the class. Let's say they got 100% on everything and then the 0% and these are all the scores in between. You see how there's much more predictive utility if I had numbers as my outcomes to explore versus just whether they passed and failed. So ideally, a statistician would rather leave things as numbers rather than categorizing them into just pass fail. However, there are times where we don't have the ability to do that. For example, gender. Right? We might have multiple categories of gender, but gender can't be really translated into a numerical outcome. So there are times when we are forced to deal with data that are nominal, um, but I want you to understand there's a limit in that ability to explore and predict. So these kinds of tests are called non-parametric tests, and we say that they have less power. Now, power and error is my next lecture, but um, I just wanted to explore or kind of plant the seed that what we're saying is that um, these non-parametric tests have less ability to find a true difference if it were um, in reality. So if, an, if there was predictive utility and we were trying to see if we could find it, we'd be less likely to find it with non-parametric tests than if we were dealing with numerical outcomes. So that's the downside for statisticians is we're always trying to make sure our data are speaking the truth and we have less likelihood of finding the truth when we have non-parametric tests because they're limited in the kind of data they're providing to us.